My name is Adam Skaggs. I'm senior counsel uh, at the Brennan Center. Uh, and I just want to start by thanking our first panel, which I, I hope everyone agrees with, with me was absolutely terrific, I think, in really setting the tone uh, for the discussion that we're going to begin now. Um, and I also want to thank all of you for being here. It's a terrific turnout. Uh, and I think it's testament to the quality of, of, of this panel, the, the initial panel, uh, and of course our keynote speaker, that we've got such a great turnout. Um, it's particularly impressive because this is not the only money in politics event happening in town today. Uh, some of you may, may know that at Union Station, the Ben & Jerry's Ice Cream Company is holding a Stamp the Money Out of Politics event, uh, and in fact giving out free ice cream. And so I think the fact that this many people have chosen to, um, chosen to, to, to choose this discussion rather than the free ice cream, um, again, just underscores what a terrific group of people we have here. So again, thanks to uh, Trevor, Michael, Sheila, and Frederica, and thanks to this terrific panel that we're about to hear from. Um, I, I think the first panel really uh, set the tone uh, by describing kind of, you know, what, what really happened, and Trevor did a great job in sort of telling us legally how we got here. What are the legal rules that have gotten us to where we are? Um, and, and finally, I think Michael's uh, charge to us, if you will, to, to move from Citizens United to Citizens Engaged uh, is a terrific way to frame what we'll be talking about in this second panel. Um, we're really trying to talk about where do we go from here? What do we do? What are the ways to bring meaningful transparency to our politics uh, and, and not only bring uh, sunlight, uh, but also to engage regular voters, to engage regular citizens, uh, to get engaged as donors, as small donors, uh, as volunteers, and as civically active, politically engaged members um, of, of the country. Um, the, the Brennan Center has uh, worked on these issues for almost two decades, and we've worked in a range of different ways, as my colleague John Cowell described um, at the outset. One of the real focuses of our work at the moment is ways to empower small donors in elections to serve as a counterweight to the mega donors that we've already heard so much about today. Um, you've heard a lot about what's going on in, in New York. We've been uh, really central to, I think, a historic coalition, uh, not just uh, the regular good government groups, not the typical reform organizations, but an incredibly broad coalition uh, involving those good government groups, involving labor, involving environmental groups, uh, and in a very impressive way involving business leaders, leaders uh, I from the business community across New York State who believe that the system there is, is, is irrevocably broken and we need fundamental systemic change. And we've been, a, I, I think, a, a key player in bringing that group together. Um, we're not just working in New York, of course, we're working across the nation, and we're also very focused on, uh, on Washington and trying to bring meaningful federal uh, reform proposals uh, to get the attention they deserve and hopefully eventually to move. Um, there are at least three proposals uh, for some variation of a public financing system, some uh, attempt to empower small donors and increase uh, participation by small donors in our elections. Um, the Brennan Center last year issued a, uh, a policy proposal that John also mentioned with Democracy 21 called Empowering Small Donors in Federal Elections. Um, we thought we'd brought enough copies of this for everybody, but the uh, overflow turnout uh, means that we didn't get enough for everyone. If you didn't get a copy of this report, you can, of course, download one from the Brennan Center's website. But this built on work uh, that Michael Malvin has done, that Norm Ornstein has done, uh, and provided a model uh, for supercharging the importance of small donations in federal elections with a, a multiple match like that that we're pursuing in New York State, like that that we have in New York City that has transformed politics there, as Michael Malvin described earlier. Uh, and we're very hopeful uh, that, uh, that, that will get real traction on these policies as we go forward. Uh, I'm delighted that our keynote speaker, Representative Chris Van Hollen, is a key co-sponsor of um, the Empowering Citizens Act, which is very closely modeled on the proposal that we put out last year. Um, so we're going to be hearing from our panelists uh, about 
the transformative possibilities of small donor public financing. Uh, we're going to hear about new ways to bring transparency and disclosure to our politics, particularly uh, on the issue of corporate political spending that one of our audience members asked about in the last session. Uh, and with no further ado, I'm delighted to introduce our panelists. Um, in the interest of time and to get right into the discussion, I'm not going to go over their entire uh, bios that, of course, you can refer to in the program, uh, but I do just want to briefly introduce them, and I'll do that in the order they'll be speaking. Uh, so first, we will hear from Mijin Shah, who is Senior Analyst at Demos, uh, where she focuses on money and politics and uh, improving our elections, how to achieve ideal elections. Um, she's the author of n reports too numerous for me to list all now, but I'll mention two of them. Again, I think we had some copies. They seemed to go very quickly, but she's an author, co-author of Stacked Deck, Stacked Deck, How the Dominance of Politics by the Affluent and business, uh, Businesses Undermine Economic Mobility in America, as well as a, a recent report called Fresh Start, which looks at the impacts of public financing in Connecticut. Um, she's written for numerous outlets, including the American Prospect, the Huffington Post, the Independent and the Demos uh, blog, which is called PolicyShop.net, and I would uh, commend that to all of you if you're not aware of it. Next, we'll hear from Chara torres Spellacy, who is currently Assistant Professor of Law at the Stetson University College of Law, uh, and formerly, I'm uh, pleased to say, was a colleague of ours at the Brennan Center. Uh, before that, she was uh, in private legal practice at Arnold and Porter, and, and also a staffer for Senator Richard Durbin. Um, uh, Char is a, a prodigious writer, and her work has been published in far more outlets than I have time uh, to list now, but they range from the New York Times, the Boston Review, Business Week, Forbes, The Atlantic, USA Today, The Hill, uh, and, and again, some terrific writings on all the subjects we'll be talking about today. And finally, this afternoon, we'll hear from Norman Ornstein. Norm is a longtime observer of Congress and of politics. Uh, he is currently a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, as well as a contributing editor and columnist for the National Journal and the Atlantic. He has authored or co-authored numerous books, uh, only one of which is most recent, I'll mention now, uh, the New York Times bestseller on the utterly dysfunctional Congress, uh, It's Even Worse Than It Looks, uh, which he authored with Tom Mann, and I'm sure he will tell us, in fact, that it is. Uh, it was named one of 2012's best uh, books on politics by The New Yorker, one of the best books of the year by The Washington Post, uh, and it's a great pleasure to welcome him and our other panelists. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to Mijin. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you to Adam and the Brennan Center for having me here today. My name is Mijin Cha. I'm a senior policy analyst at an organization called Demos, which is a nonpartisan public policy organization working for an economy where everyone has an equal chance and a democracy where everyone has an equal voice. I'm here today to talk about a report that we released that looked at Connecticut's public financing program. Um, and what we did was we took a combination of empirical data that people have done and looking at public financing systems and their outcomes, we're combining it with uh, direct interviews with legislators to see how they felt about the program, both past and current. Um, so Connecticut is the first state to implement a public financing system legislatively. Uh, Maine and Arizona have done it through referendum. And it came about in a time where Connecticut had several high-profile corruption cases, uh, so much so that the state was nicknamed Corrupticut. So they managed to pass through uh, at this, sorry, this is set of uh, reforms, electoral reforms that did several things, uh, including banning lobbyists and state contractors from contributing. Uh, it banned something that's called an ad book, which is a way to kind of circumvent campaign finance contribution limits um, by purchasing ad space and fundraising programs. Um, and it established the state's public financing program. So what the state's public financing program does, it, it provides public funds to candidates who voluntarily enroll and they need to raise an aggregate amount of small contributions anywhere between five and hundred dollars before they can qualify for a lump sum grant. And what we found is that participation in Connecticut's program is very high. It's a very popular program and in fact in 2012 they had record number of participants and 77 percent of current sitting legislators uh, ran on public financing. And in fact all of their statewide offices are held by people who are public finance candidates, uh, including the governor who faced a really severe, uh, big challenge by outside money and still managed to win with using just public financing. Um, 
So in speaking with the legislators, both past and current, what we found was that there were several benefits of the program, and it really is something that they have come to embrace as a, a much better system than what was before. Uh, the first was that they found that it really did help cut down on the time spent in fundraising. Uh, legislators are able to spend much more time with constituents. What we heard was that generally they kind of finish their fundraising early and then can spend the summer and the rest of the campaign season just talking to folks. They really like the fact that they can focus only on small donors. You know, a couple of them are telling us they prefer to have five to twenty dollar donations. And what they usually do is they just hold kind of like a big open fundraiser so that as many people can come as possible. Not necessarily to raise money, but just so that they can talk to more people and engage with more constituents and get more points of view. Um, we also found that public, increase, public financing increases the number of donors and diversifies both of the candidates and the donor profiles. And then in turn, because you're diversifying your candidates, you're changing who gets elected for office. So you're seeing more people of color, more women are being elected, which is more representative, of course, as a state overall. Um, but perhaps the biggest benefit for legislators that we found was that there was a shift in their mentality and it really decreased the influence and the hold that lobbyists and corporate money had over them. Um, one in particular was telling us a story about how, you know, during session before public financing, they had these things that he referred to as shakedowns, where you had to go to a corporate or lobbyist event because you really relied on their money. Uh, that mentality is really decreasing as you see public financing take hold. Um, and what we also heard was that the newer legislators that are coming in, that are coming in under public financing, aren't, don't even realize that they have to check with lobbyists before they make decisions. Um, and what we see, well, that's what they say anyway. Uh, and you get the sense that as the program continues and it, you know, more people on, come in under public financing, that will just continue to diminish the lobbyist influence. Um, the other interesting thing that we found was that they said that there was a real change in the actual legislative process. That before, you know, there were a lot of random kind of stops and holds that were put on behalf of special interests. And that's really been removed. So there's a lot more time spent on the actual substance of the legislation. Uh, there is much more time spent talking to colleagues. There are more big pieces of legislation that are being introduced and passed with bipartisanship. Um, and so the sense that we got was that it's a much more substantive legislative process. Um, and along those lines, we found that even though it's only three cycles in, the number of policies that have passed through the legislature that are more in line with public's interests and better for working families of Connecticut is pretty significant. Um, since public financing has taken place, uh, Connecticut has increased our minimum wage. They've passed the first statewide paid sick days initiative, uh, a state earned income tax credit, and in-state tuition for undocumented students. And the, perhaps the best example that we kept hearing over and over again about how removing m money has changed the legislative process is something about bottle bill deposits. So for nearly 30 years, advocates had tried to remove um, the ability for unclaimed bottle deposits before then were going back to the beer and soda distributors. And for 30 years, advocates were trying to get that unclaimed money back to the state to be used for conservation programs or public programs. Um, and what we heard was it was literally one lobbyist that was able to stop that money from going back to the state um, for decades. In the first session after public financing was adopted, the legislature passed a bill that brings that unclaimed bottle deposits back to the states, to back to the state, sorry, to the tune of about $24 million per year. So when you think about the cost of public financing, with public financing, the state has now come up with $24 million, which pays for their program, the public financing program, two and a half times over. Uh, unfortunately, this past, legisl legis what's this past legislative session, what we saw were some step backs, setbacks in the public financing system. Um, there were some disclosure provisions that you heard that were good, but they could have been much stronger, obviously. Uh, the big, two big problems were that they doubled the contribution limits for state parties to, from 5,000 to 10,000, and to town committees from 1,000 to 2,000. And the, for, for me, the biggest setback was that they reintroduced the ad books. Um, there's a contribution limit of $250, but these are the kind of measures that you see that slowly start to chip away at public financing and really start to open the door for money to kind of trickle back into the electoral system. Um, so looking forward, you know, stronger disclosure laws would be much better for Connecticut as well. And as I mentioned, Connecticut just gives a lump sum once you've qualified for public financing. Um, and as you've heard a few times, a continuing matching program would help bring more donors into the electoral system and also help legislate candidates continue to raise money, which may also help diminish the outsized influence of outside money. Um, so Connecticut took a really big step in adopting the public financing system, and we see that it has great potential. It already has several successes. What needs to happen is that the system needs to be strengthened and expanded if possible.
Um, and you know, the reason why we really worry about money in our electoral system is that it starts to distort our democracy, right? So the priorities of the wealthy really dominate both the electoral process and also the legislative process. So the policies that you're seeing passed are really helping just the donor class. And until we get money out of our political system and out of our electoral system, that dynamic will continue. So public financing is really the first step, in, the first fundamental step in ensuring a legislative system that is more democratic and more responsive to constituents. Thank you. Good afternoon. <laughs> Just checking to see if you're awake because I have the unenviable position of trying to make the Securities and Exchange Commission seem sexy and interesting. Um, but let me start here. This is a picture of my dad. And when I was younger, he used to tell me, Chara, remember to ask the big questions. And the big question that I've been asking for the past six years is, what's the proper role of corporate money in a democracy? But the question that I'm going to be posing today is, should the SEC require transparency for corporate political spending? And spoiler alert, I think the answer to this question is yes. And one of the reasons that I think the answer to this question is yes is the SEC already regulates money in politics, and I'm going to go through three different areas where that's already the case. One is under the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, and then I'll go through two anti-pay-to-play rules that the SEC enforces. So when I started researching the SEC, my biggest fear was boredom. And when I got uh, the reams of papers from my research assistants, I really wanted to gouge my eyes out, and I didn't want to read those papers, but I did it for love of God and country, and I did it so that you wouldn't have to. And when I finally opened up those pages and read reams and reams of, of, of pages about the Securities and Exchange Commission, what I realized is what I was researching was a story about money and power. So the SEC entered the fray of regulating money and politics in the 1970s. And here's that story. After a famous bungled burglary here at the Watergate, these reporters decided to follow the money. Congress, of course, held investigations into Watergate, both the burglary and into Nixon's reelection campaign, and they found that the two were linked. One of the things that Congress realized is the burglary was paid for in part by the Committee for the Reelection of the President, otherwise known as CREEP, and uh, CREEP got some of its money from these corporations. And the fact that the money came from the corporate treasuries of these corporations was a problem. And the problem was it was patently illegal both then and now under a law called the Tillman Act. So as every school child in America knows, as a result of Watergate, Nixon resigns. But what is much less known is that the Securities and Exchange Commission launched an enormous investigation into not just the corporations that were caught by the Watergate prosecutors, but they decided to expand disclosure and look at basically every publicly traded company. They asked them, have you too given to uh, a candidate? And meanwhile, over at, at the Securities and Exchange Commission back in the 70s, uh, Stanley Sporkin, who is the director of enforcement, asked his own big questions, um, including, how does Gulf Oil account for a $50,000 cash payment to uh, Creep? Do they have an account called bribery? And it turns out that uh, was not too far off from the truth. Um, hundreds of US corporations came forward and admitted to the Securities and Exchange Commission that they had what can only be charitably described as political slush funds. And that's the SEC's terminology, not mine. 
the largest political slush fund was at Gulf Oil, but Gulf Oil was far from being alone. And when the SEC looked into the matter further, what they found is not only had money gone to the Nixon re-election campaign, it had gone to several Democrats. And a significant amount of money had gone to foreign officials in what I think a layman would just call a bribe. And part of the reason that this concerned the Securities and Exchange Commission is the slush funds were at such a big level that the financials that these corporations were giving to their investors were materially misleading. And so after the SEC finds this rat's nest uh, in, the, in the 1970s, they actually take an almost lobbyist role in advocating for a new anti-bribery law, which will become uh, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. The FCPA is, of course, a long and complicated um, document, but for our purposes here, it requires that issuers keep honest books and records. And it also bans corporations, whether they are publicly traded or not, to uh, they're banned from giving uh, bribes to foreign officials to get or keep business. So ever since 1978, the SEC has had jurisdiction under the FCPA to regulate campaign contributions that go towards foreign officials. And this is part of the law that the SEC and DOJ jointly administer, and they do enforce this part of the law. Uh, Titan had to pay a $28.5 million fine for violating this part of the FCPA for money that was funneled into the incumbent um, re-election campaign of the president of Benin. So let's transition from the international to the local. The SEC also regulates money and politics in the municipal bond market. And the municipal bond market is really a bit of a hot mess. Um, one thing you should know is that it's very large. It's nearly $4 trillion. And one of the ways you could conceptualize this is when a city or a town wants something but can't afford it, they just buy it on credit. So what, what could possibly go wrong if you gave 50,000 different uh, American cities and towns a credit card? One problem is if they don't have fiscal discipline, then they can borrow more than they can afford, and they can literally go bankrupt. And this isn't theoretical. This has happened in California and elsewhere. But uh, for our purposes today, one of the things that I'm really worried about is the risk of corruption that the municipal bond market presents. If uh, the, the private banks that bring municipal bonds to market get that business through pay to play, then there's a real huge risk for quid pro quo corruption. And I, I love this quote, um, which is from David Clapp. He is a former Goldman Sachs partner, and he describes having uh, uh, pay to play uh, in his face, if you will. He, he is sitting at a dinner party. Someone comes up to him and says, I'm raising money for this candidate. They would like $50,000 from you. And he says, well, I don't have $50,000 to give that candidate. And then the response back is, well, then you're got, not going to be able to do business with that candidate. So in other words, if you don't pay, you can't play in that bond market. And problems like that came to light in the early 1990s um, when Chair Levitt came to power under uh, President Clinton. And he came to the job with a real passion for rooting out this type of corruption. So he asks the Municipal Securities Rulemaking Board to promulgate a rule to stop pay to play in the municipal bond market. And they do just that. Uh, they promulgate Rule G37. The basic structure of the rule is you can, as a bond underwriter, you can either give money to a mayoral candidate or you can do municipal bond business with that city, but you can't do the both at the same time. There has to be a two-year lag between giving big campaign contributions and doing business with the city in that way. 
And the rule is instantly challenged on First Amendment grounds by William Blount, who's pictured here. Uh, Mr. Blount is now a guest of the state uh, in his own <laughs> in his own pay-to-play um, uh, scandal, but that's another story for another day. But back in the 1990s, he um, challenged the rule and his challenge was rebuffed. Uh, the DC Circuit upheld the SEC's uh, authority here, and part of the court's reasoning was that underwriters' campaign contributions self-evidently create a conflict of interest. So ever since 1994, the SEC has had jurisdiction over pay to play in the municipal bond market. And they also enforced this part of the law just last year. Uh, Goldman Sachs was, um, had to pay nearly $12 million for violating this particular rule. So let's transition from the municipal bond market to the public pension fund market. Once again, the SEC has stepped in to protect the market from pay to play. Now, public pension funds are the retirement accounts of public workers, um, say your firefighters or your police. And public pension funds are massive amounts of money. Um, for example, in the state of New York, uh, the public pension funds on any given day is about $150 billion. But it doesn't just sit there in a bank account, it gets invested into the stock market. And uh, investment advisors are hired by the state of New York to invest that money so that as each tranche of retirees retires, you know, every day, there's uh, enough money there to pay for their retirements. And this market is also huge. It is over $4 trillion, but a lot of that gets eaten up in investment fees uh, to the tune of billions of dollars in investment fees a year. And with so much money at stake, so much uh, money on the table, there's this uh, temptation for elected officials who control such big pension funds to actually sell those investment opportunities in exchange for campaign contributions. And this isn't theoretical. Um, in New York, uh, New York lost its comptroller to such a pay-to-play scandal. Connecticut lost its state treasurer to such a pay-to-play scandal all about investing public pension fund money. So at the beginning of the Obama administration, the SEC shows, showed some real leadership once again and promulgated a new rule uh, that addresses pay to play in the public pension fund system. And the structure is very similar to the municipal bond rule. Basically, uh, a entity, uh, a, a underwriter can give to you know, the governor of a state or they can do uh, public pension fund business for that state, but they can't do it at the same time. And in justifying the rule, the then chair of the SEC, um, Mary Shapiro, said pay to play is both corrupt and corrupting. And the good news is that the rule has already worked. And we saw this in the 2012 presidential election where Governor Perry was the only sitting governor who was running for office. And so he was subject to actually both of the anti-pay to play rules that I've uh, talked about today, which meant that investment banks had to make a choice. They could either give big to Perry's uh, presidential run or they could do business with the state of Texas. And if you don't want to take my word for it, this is the um, advice that Skadden Arps gave to its corporate clients, basically warning them, if you give big to the Perry campaign, you may have to sit out business with the state of Texas for two years. So all of that was a mouthful. What else is new? I think what else is new and why we need a new disclosure rule from the SEC is the rules of the game have fundamentally changed with Citizens United. Now corporations can spend an unlimited amount of their corporate treasury funds on political ads. And corporations are already using their Citizens United rights. Um, Gulf Oil, who I referenced in relation to the Watergate uh, scandal, is now known as Chevron. 
and Chevron was the biggest on the books publicly traded company that spent in the 2012 election. But what I'm worried about is not the on the books spending, it's the dark money spending that we can't see. So if you have a, a corporation that decides that it doesn't have the courage of its own convictions, then if it funnels its money through a 501c4 or a 501c6, then it just, it's, it's, as if it, it's as if it disappeared because the public can't see through this black box to the original corporate source. And that means that the public can't tell who the big money is behind a given political ad. And according to my friends at Demos, over $300 million in the last um, cycle was dark. So in response to Citizens United, 10 corporate law professors have written a petition to the SEC asking for a new rule requiring transparency of corporate political spending. And the public has really responded to this. Um, a record breaking 600, and now it's over, it's 600,000 plus um, public comments have been filed at the Securities and Exchange Commission. This is the most comments that have ever been filed at, uh, on a petition at the SEC. And I would argue to you that the investing public needs to see this money before it's laundered. Thank you. Thanks, it's great to be here, uh, this uh, terrific conference. Um, I wanna do a few things uh, this afternoon uh, and as we look ahead, uh, but let me just start with a preface. These are dark days for those of us uh, who wanna remove the influence of a small power elite or reduce it uh, in our politics uh, with no accountability uh, and to reduce the level of corruption that uh, flows from it. Uh, Citizens United uh, governs us and uh, it's not going anywhere soon and frankly the signs from the Supreme Court are pretty troubling ones. If you look, uh, uh, dig into the decision yesterday in the Arizona voting case, uh, what we see is that uh, the court accepted a distinction between uh, the federal role in regulating the structure of federal elections but gives it to the states uh, to decide who can vote. Uh, and uh, that's a distinction I would not accept, but it's uh, very likely going to lead down a, a pretty difficult path as we look down the road. Uh, the judicial route at this point uh, is not a particularly promising one, and sometimes when people ask me if there's, you could do one thing, what would it be? I say a generous retirement fund for Justice Anthony Kennedy, uh, who uh, authored the Citizens United uh, decision. Until there's a change in the Supreme Court, we've got uh, a difficult road to hoe. And I wanna add that, you know, as we look at uh, the impact of uh, dark money and big money out there, uh, we shouldn't ignore the fact that it increases enormously as you move down the chain. And the biggest impact and the most frightening to me is in judicial elections. And yesterday was another dark day if you read stories about how in North Carolina, uh, Art Pope, who's now the budget director, uh, uh, purportedly convinced a legislator uh, who was going to uh, find a way to keep funding, uh, public funding for judicial elections in the state uh, from doing so. And if you think about what happens when you get big money in judicial elections and you have judges sitting there deciding cases, knowing that if they decide in a particular way, an interest that's gonna be hurt may very well pour millions into the next uh, judicial election uh, and alter the outcome of those cases. And if you think about where judges running for election raise money, it has to be from the people uh, uh, who practice in front of them. And we're seeing increasing examples of big money going in to knock off judges uh, and alter those cases. And then you think about what is really fundamental to a democracy, which is an independent judiciary and the rule of law. And uh, we've got our challenges ahead. So the judicial route, where we're still gonna have to pursue it and try in states uh, to uh, counter some of the impact that's out there and try and figure out ways to keep the court 
the Supreme Court from continuing down what could easily be uh, an inexorable path that now says, well, gee, now parties are weaker. Now we've got to let them have unlimited money to put into campaigns and uh, move to the next step, which is openly allowing corporations to influence directly uh, elections. Uh, those are steps that are not that far off. That's a challenge. The second route, obviously, uh, that we can turn to uh, is uh, the uh, legislative route, and I'm going to come to that in a minute. And we've had a little bit of discussion about the regulatory route, but let me talk a little bit more about that. Clearly, what we can do in the interim to try and mitigate the influence of some of these factors is both to try and level the playing field more by uh, increasing and enhancing the impact of small donors, uh, which we've heard a lot about and which I will endorse in a ringing fashion in a few minutes, as well as to enhance disclosure so that at least we can have some sense of the avenues of the money coming in and hold people more accountable. The SEC is one area. Uh, one of the real challenges we have there is if you happen to watch uh, or read about the uh, hearing that the House Financial Services Committee had uh, with the uh, SEC commissioners, uh, there was a pretty overt attempt to bludgeon them into submission to keep them from moving forward to, re to require uh, 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 publicly traded corporations from disclosing their political expenditures. So there's plenty of intimidation going on there. Uh, but at least that's one avenue where we can hope for some change. There's the Federal Communications Commission, which encouragingly uh, at least began the process uh, uh, last year of uh, doing something that is a no-brainer, I believe, and should be obvious and is there under the law, which is to require stations not just to disclose who's funding the advertising that they put on the air, but to put it up in a form that people can actually see and read. Uh, now, this is a requirement under the law, but in the past, if you wanted to see uh, what ads were going up and who was funding them, you had to go to an individual station and get records that were basically piled up in a back room and impossible to sort through, and in many cases, the stations would refuse to give you access even though they were required under the law. It was a massive and impossible task. Uh, the FCC has moved forward with the notion that all of this should be put up and actually on an FCC website where you can gain access, broadcasters are fighting it tooth and nail because, of course, the single largest source of revenue now for broadcasters is political advertising. And the more that comes in from outside groups, which is not lowest unit rate, often not only the full retail price but a little bit more, uh, the better off they do, the more there's disclosure, uh, the uh, less uh, revenue may come in, and so we're getting this fought uh, bitterly. But there's another avenue that could work with the FCC as well, uh, which is to apply the same standards of truthfulness in advertising that is politically oriented, but issue uh, ads that they apply to other kinds of advertising, which they're also reluctant to do. But there are openings and opportunities on an FCC that should have the votes to be able to move forward. And of course, we have the FEC, which is a complete lost cause and unlikely to change soon. Unfortunately, uh, President Obama did not take the opportunity uh, last year before we had another set of uh, deleterious court rulings on recess appointments to do what he should have done, I believe, which is to fill five, at that point, five of the six Federal Election Commission posts where commissioners had long run out their uh, stay and were staying on only because there were no appointments and Mitch McConnell continues to block anybody but from serving. So that opportunity is not there, and there isn't much that can be done. And we've got the IRS. And I do want to talk a little bit about the IRS. Unfortunately, we've had an enormous setback in the ability to actually get the IRS to do what it long has failed to do and should have done, uh, which is to enforce its own regulations, and in particular to write regulations that are clearly, uh, in my judgment, mandated uh, by the law. And I've been struck by this for a long time. When you have a law on 501c4s that says that they are exclusively social welfare organizations, and you first set out a regulation that says they are primarily, I thought, well, what if a marriage contract were defined in that way? Uh, 
Some people might be happy, but a whole lot of people would say that's not the intent of the law, and uh, clearly that's not the intent of the contract. That shouldn't be the intent of the law. Now, Fran Hill, who knows more about these things than anybody else, says that the primarily uh, is something used throughout uh, contract law, that it's uh, a, a way of saying you've got to have a little bit of wiggle room here. And I could live with that if you then define primarily as overwhelmingly, preponderantly, and set a level, 90%, 95%. Instead, what the IRS has done over the years is to sit back, utterly passively refuse to define opaque regulations, and let rapacious sharks, known as campaign finance lawyers, come in and define themselves what the limits are and define it as 50% and then uh, use their own wiggle room within all of that. So the problems that we have now emerging uh, with the definition of 501c4s are in a significant way self-inflicted wounds and wounds done, uh, I think, by career people who did not fulfill their own fiduciary responsibilities. We can only hope that once we get past the feeding frenzy of Daryl Issa and others uh, uh, on this front, and I suspect there'll be a little bit of a backlash as there's an overreach uh, here, that we can then come back and perhaps, and I think we need to participate in this process, get a much more vigorous discussion that begins to draw the appropriate lines given where the law is on what limits there are in nonprofit organizations misusing this process uh, for their own uh, purposes. Now beyond that we have, of course, the legislative route. A legislative route which is a difficult and long and winding one in the dysfunctional political process that we have. And let's face it, we live in a world where the Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell would set uh, the issue of uh, campaign finance rules as perhaps his top priority, that he will do almost anything necessary to keep any change from taking place. And he has been extraordinarily effective in doing so. If you think about a reality where a Disclose Act can pass the House handily, come to the Senate and get 59 votes, and fall one vote short because not a single Republican senator including those who had eagerly and avidly supported campaign finance reform in the past, including those who had authored or co-authored the key provisions of the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act that were, uh, in effect, eviscerated by uh, the Citizens United decision, would refuse to break the filibuster uh, on that. It tells you that there is some kind of supernatural power that McConnell has been able to wield uh, over them. I don't know where the ring is that he was able to get a hold of uh, and how we can get it and throw it in the volcano, but, uh, <laughs> but it's going to make it very difficult. That should not stop us from moving forward both in states and model statutes and with a modified uh, Disclose Act in moving forward. And obviously, we need to try and tilt the balance and change the dialogue that we have on the whole nature of campaign finance by moving forward with a set of proposals for the next generation, hoping that at some point the balance in the court will tilt enough that we can then do something that can move us forward into the networked age. And that's something that uh, I was proud to work on with Michael Malbin and Tom Mann and Tony Corrado. And much of it uh, with ideas both that we had tossed around and in other ways that have been embodied in the work in New York, uh, but also in the Price Van Hollen bill, uh, which I strongly support. Uh, and I think uh, people ought to look at the Price Van Hollen bill. And those who are uh, in the reform community who are opposed to it and yet inexplicably strongly support uh, proposals in New York that do exactly the same thing, uh, oppose it because it would put limits on overall contributions but not send them down to the $100 or $200 level should rethink uh, what they're doing. We don't have any realistic chance of moving that bill forward to get it enacted into law in the short run, but we had no realistic chance back in the mid-1990s uh, 
or before of getting the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act or anything close to it enacted. It took years of effort, and it may take another major scandal, as John McCain has said, to move it forward, but we've got to both get it out there and promote it and begin to get a different public dialogue that recognizes even more the dangers that exist in this process. And I want to end with just one other point. I read the Citizens United decision with increasing uh, bewilderment at the reasoning uh, that Justice Kennedy put into uh, his decision. It is otherworldly in so many ways. But what I found particularly otherworldly was the notion that uh, this kind of campaign-related activity, uh, because it's independent, has no relationship to corruption. What planet has this man been living on? And it's obviously a planet which is utterly removed from the real world of politics. Because the fact is, this dark money and the ability to pour unlimited sums in anonymously in the last weeks of a campaign is on the minds of every incumbent member of Congress. If you're left with the nightmare of a process where you go into a campaign and with no time left for you to raise money, somebody can come in with unlimited sums to slime you. When somebody comes in and says, you know, I represent campaigns, I represent Americans for a better America, and they really, really want this amendment, and if they don't get it, they got more money than God, they're going to leave and you're going to be thinking, it's one little amendment. The fact is you don't have to spend the money to have the corrupting influence in this process. And that members, to protect themselves against something like this, are going to go out and find their own sugar daddies, if they can, or raise huge sums of money as insurance, which means that they'll be going out with the two roots of corruption, both shaking down donors using the power of a, uh, uh, the state that you have as an actor who can influence policy, or begging for money which will have an implicit a return on an investment. This is deeply corrupting, and until and unless we can convince more and more Americans of how bad this is, and until we can change the nature of the Supreme Court, we have got to try and find other avenues and other routes uh, to begin to move forward to a better day. Thank you. Thank you, Norm, and, and thank you um, to the other panelists as well. Uh, before uh, opening it up to some questions from the audience, I just want to repeat a question that was presented to the, to the earlier panel, but which refers to the IRS scandal and the, the C4 issue. Um, I'd like to hear the panelists' opinion on whether or not you think this is simply going to make it much more difficult to move forward, either with legislation or with any of the regulatory um, solutions that, that Chara and, and Norm have talked about, or, or whether there may be some way that this will allow groups on both sides of the aisle to find common ground and say, you know what, we, we may think this was a problem for different reasons, but we all agree this was inappropriate. We need some bright lines. We need some clear, uh, clear lines to follow, and whether there may actually be some ability to, to leverage this latest round of scandals uh, for actual positive uh, momentum. I would say first we need to go on the offensive more on this, but we also have to be a little bit careful here. Uh, care, I, I've bashed the IRS in the past for its timidity and unwillingness to uh, uh, do what it ought to do, but you know this is now being seized upon by people who want to use it to uh, foment hostility with government more generally. The IRS is never going to be very popular, and uh, so we need to take some care here, but I think we can go on the offensive by saying it's time to draw bright lines. And there may be allies elsewhere, uh, unexpected allies uh, willing to do that. Yeah, the one thing that I would say that's encouraging about the IRS scandal is I used to have to explain to people what a C4 was. <laughs> and now uh, that discussion has become uh, much more widespread where people understand that if money goes through a C4, that it becomes dark and it becomes unaccountable. And the public, whether that's the investing public 
or the voting public can't tell who is uh, behind the negative campaign ads that they are seeing on their television sets. So I think one of the good things that has come out of this is um, it's been a, a public education moment and we need to know what the problem is before we can um, get to the solutions. Well, let's open it up. Uh, are there any questions uh, from the audience, ma'am? Thank you for your presentation. Do you think there will ever be a time when we will, I guess, you, I don't know how you do, change the Supreme Court so they're not there for life? And that we have, you know, Supreme Court members are appointed for life. And I think judicial appointments are tough local, state. But should the Supreme Court be there for life? And if not, how do you change it? I, I actually, beginning about uh, 12 or 15 years ago, when we uh, really began to ratchet up uh, the political stakes on uh, uh, not just Supreme Court, but uh, the, uh, courts of appeals uh, nominees, I began to write pieces uh, suggesting term limits. Um, and what I would like to see is an, a single 18-year term for uh, Supreme Court justices um, staggered so that, in effect, you don't have uh, the luck of the actuarial tables where one president can uh, pick four justices and another gets none. You would have two, in effect, for uh, every president. But also, you would have other positive benefits that come from a single 18-year term. Nobody, no president now, is going to pick uh, for a Supreme Court justice anybody over 60 uh, because you want to have an impact that lasts 30 or 40 years. Uh, one of the people who I think would have made a great uh, uh, justice, uh, J. Harvey Wilkinson, uh, who was a Lewis Powell in many ways, was basically off the list because he had turned 60. If it's a single 18-year term, you're going to broaden the pool of uh, people who could be uh, chosen. And that's still a long enough period of time that you can have an enormous impact. So what are the chances of that happening? Uh, slim to none. And Slim just left the building. You know, while we're on the subject of the Supreme Court, it strikes me one of the things we haven't talked about today is the, um, the upcoming, what's been called Citizens United II, or could it be Citizens United II, the uh, McCutcheon case in which the Supreme Court will um, will address the aggregate contribution limits, uh, not the underlying $2,600 contribution limit that uh, any individual can give to any one candidate, but the overall limits um, that, uh, that, that, that uh, cap the aggregate amount that any one donor can give to candidates and political parties and other uh, uh, committees as well. I wonder if anyone on the panel would hazard a guess as to um, how you think the McCutcheon case will come out when we hear that argued in the fall. Any? I don't know how you could be brave souls. Yeah. <laughs> about any of this, uh, uh, I, I'm very fearful of, uh, that they'll blow these limits. And let, I, I do want to emphasize here, too, something that we've talked about often. Uh, the public notion of corruption is some evil force coming in from outside and forcing legislators to do or inducing legislators to do what they otherwise would not do, which is a real problem. But believe me, there's just as much at the other end of the shakedown that takes place. And if you take away from individuals even the uh, protection that comes from saying, I'm sorry, I've maxed out, you end up with an even worse situation. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, this question is for Mr. Norman. Um, I couldn't agree with you more on your statements on how our pu public financing laws and, and our donations, uh, that whole process is broken. But at the end of the day, when you're running a campaign, it's about communicating a message. And to communicate that message, it costs money. So in your opinion, I kind of wanted to hear your feedback. What would be a good process where, um, you know, kind of balance out this, this, this act? We often get attacked for wanting to take money out of politics. Uh, most of us who are uh, in these vineyards understand that you need money to communicate. Uh, the question is, where does the money come from? How do you raise that money? And that's why uh, I, Mike and uh, uh, Tom and uh, Tony and I you know, came up with a plan that really tried to leverage and enhance uh, uh, expanding the base of, uh, of small donors and giving people rewards from raising money from small donors. You've got to find ways to get people uh, resources so that they can communicate in campaigns. And there are other ways of doing it as well, including 
expanding television time and finding other venues uh, in in kind contributions uh, and the like. Uh, you know, there, you, you, but the idea that you just limit the amount of money going into campaigns, given that you exist in a free society where there are multiple ways where others can communicate, it becomes a problem. One of the real problems I have with Citizens United now is that candidates themselves can get drowned out in this process and squeezed out in this process. If you're a television station and you have an obligation to provide time to candidates and they get the lowest unit rate, but other people are coming in and throwing money at you and saying, I'll give you much more for that spot, you can preempt them and move them to a less desirable spot. And that's what's happening here, too. So the, what I think is the meaningful part of this process where speech is important for citizens, you want to hear from the candidates. You want to know what the candidates are saying. If they become minor players in this process, which is what the idea that money is speech and, and you can have unlimited sums of it around does, some people have bigger megaphones, and if the candidates have smaller megaphones, then we all suffer uh, as a consequence. Could I add to that? I mean, I get in, in certain quarters uh, a certain amount of pushback on my focus on publicly traded companies. Um, but one of the reasons that I focus on publicly traded companies is that they are so ginormous. Um, there are publicly traded companies in the US um, on the New York Stock Exchange who have revenues that go through them which are bigger than the GDPs of most, com most countries. And that is a really difficult um, situation for a candidate to deal with because you are competing with a, a competitor who has more money than certain nations have. And so getting your political message out as a candidate becomes all the more challenging when you are up against that type of, um, I think big money doesn't even capture it. Uh, yeah, and I think what you're seeing now is actually some kind of nuclear arms race where people are just spending more and more money and there's, it, it's hard to see where it will end. And then if you look at states like Connecticut that have public financing, you can run a really great campaign and be successful for just a fraction of what is being spent in other races. Yes, sir, in the corner. Um, I'd like to ask a question that I think really needs to be asked, and, and there are a lot of people who are promoting the idea of amending the Constitution uh, that, you know, in a way that raises the question or, or really answers the question from the, uh, the 19th century Santa Clara decision, you know, which was a very questionable ruling that said that, um, uh, that corporations were persons because the 14th Amendment didn't, didn't exclude artificial persons. This idea that uh, corporations have free speech rights because they're persons under the Constitution, which is used by Citizens United to say that the free speech rights of corporations overwhelm the equality rights of people uh, and allows a system where corporations can buy so much media time that an average person can't compete in getting uh, an influence on policy. Would anyone want to comment about the move to amend and, and whether they think corporations really were meant to have free speech rights under the Constitution? Uh, I find the whole notion that corporations could be considered the same as people bizarre, first. Uh, corporations have one motive. Uh, it is, uh, and it's increasingly becoming a motive of short-term profits. People have many motives. Some of them are pecuniary and very self-interested. Some of them are interested more broadly in the society. Others look at the longer term. We care about our children and our grandchildren and those futures. We have multiple motives. The idea that these are all the same and should be the same for the purposes of law, uh, I just find alien. Uh, can you change that? Uh, you could with a different Supreme Court. And then the question becomes, if you don't get that, do you move towards a constitutional amendment? And it might be a constitutional amendment that would deal with many other things, too, including uh, some of the broader uh, issues that involved uh, athletic maneuvers in the Supreme Court when it decided uh, Buckley v. Vallejo. Um, 
but the odds of getting a constitutional amendment uh, in the short or medium term are, again, slim to none. Uh, and the question becomes, how much of your time, attention, and resources do you devote to something which has a much lower chance of passage even than a commendable bill like the Disclose Act or uh, Price Van Hollen? And uh, I say it's fine to open this up to enlarge the dialogue so that people can understand how ridiculous it is to consider corporations the same as people. But a lot of resources expended on that front uh, at the expense of other uh, practical things, including in states, uh, I'd rather not see. Go ahead, add to that. Um, I don't think that there's necessarily a problem with corporate personhood per se. It is useful for corporations to be persons for the purposes of contract and for the purposes of torts. Where I think the Supreme Court has made the wrong turn is um, in Bellotti and in Citizens United in giving them co-equal um, political rights as a human being. And I think time will tell, um, and I hope that in the same way that Citizens United itself was a reverse of precedent, that this precedent itself becomes reversed. Sir, did you have a question? Well, I just wanted to follow up about the SEC as you know, somebody, your presentation was great, I thought, by the way. And, and as somebody who's really looked at the SEC, do you have an opinion about where they're going on this, how, whether they have an interest in getting into this? I mean, clearly they have done it in a somewhat limited way before, but a sort of blanket rule on disclosure for all public corporations, do you think that's going to happen? Well, uh, at the end of uh, December, the SEC put on the OMB's uh, rulemaking agenda that they have this rule on their docket. Um, now, the date that they had in that um, regulatory agenda was uh, April of this year, which I think has already come and passed. Um, so we are hopeful that the SEC will still take this rule up this year. It is really in the hands of the new chair, uh, who really just took office a couple of weeks ago, Mary Jo White. Um, but I am very hopeful that uh, her instincts as a, a former prosecutor uh, will kick in and that she will see the value of transparency, whether it is for investors or for voters. Thanks. I think we have. Uh Time for one or two more questions, yes. Thank you, and uh, thank you for re-asking my question from the first panel. Um, for uh, Mr. Ornstein and Ms. Cha and Mr. Skaggs, if you're inclined to, uh, to address it as well, um, do your organizations disclose all of their donors? And if they've decided not to, why, uh, why have they decided that, either not to disclose all or some of them? is I have no idea. Um, I mean, it's a, uh, a, mine is a 501c3. Uh, the donors are disclosed, I guess, in the Form 990. Um, uh, and so far as I know, all the donors are disclosed, but I, I haven't really looked at it in public. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, we are also a 501c3 nonpartisan, and all of our donors are disclosed. I'm not sure I have much to add to those previous responses. Did, uh, ma'am, did you have a question? There's a lot of donors that are um, involved in this process that are pretty tired of it, too. Uh, and I just wondered if there was a progressive effort to put together $10 million a year over the course of between now and the 2016 elections to really change the way this process works. Where would each of you make that kind of investment over the next uh, three, three and a half years? I'll just take the moderator's prerogative to answer that. And Building on the previous answer, uh, building on the previous answer, we are a 501c3 and <laughs> therefore uh, don't, um, are not in the business of spending money in elections nor advising others as to the ways in which they may effectively spend it. I don't know if any of the other panelists would have a different response. Let me just say, one of the dismaying things for me is that, you know, back when we were really in the vineyards to trying to get uh, McCain-Feingold or some variation of it passed, we had a lot of big foundations who understood the importance of this and put a lot of resources into it. And after it passed, most of them basically just withdrew from the playing field. 
and it's been a real struggle since then. And, you know, uh, the other side has found huge sums of money, and they've been able to go in and swoop into states and uh, get involved in the judicial process and the legislative process. They're filing lawsuits all over the place. Uh, I'm on the board of the Campaign Legal Center, uh, which has, you know, done valiant work to uh, get engaged as well. But, you know, the resources have simply not been there. I don't think there would be any difficulty if there were $10 million a year available to find ample ways to begin to change the dialogue and to affect things. And I just wish that some of the large foundations that decided that their work was done uh, and withdrew would come back and engage. That there are some really interesting things going on that actually provide a lot of hope. I think you know the New York State fight is a good example of interest of different people who necessarily weren't aligned before, all realizing that if, until we get money out of politics, none of the issues are going to advance. I think those kind of coalitions, there's also the Democracy Initiative as well, really will help advance this idea that until we get money out of our electoral system, nothing is going to happen. Um, and you know, I think I do think that there are some foundations that are starting to also re-engage. I think. What we heard last time is what we really need, citizens engaged. And until you really have an engaged electorate, I think this, the successes will be a little bit limited. Well, I think that's a, a great way to wrap it up. As, as Norm said, these are dark days. But as Mijin points out, we do have uh, an unprecedented number of groups uh, that are engaged on this. And, and, and frankly, an unprecedented number of citizens uh, who are aware of, of the real crisis that's facing the country in terms of the role of money in politics. Uh, you know, campaign finance reform usually kind of puts people to sleep, but I think what we saw last year uh, has made people appreciate the importance of the issue in a way that they haven't before. So I hope that there's some hope there for an engaged uh, uh, movement. Uh, we're going to take a short break, about five minutes. Our keynote speaker uh, should be here shortly. Uh, and uh, in the interest of getting him up here as soon as we can, we do ask you to uh, keep this break short. But let's reconvene uh, after we give thanks to this terrific panel. Thank you.